The kingdom is here right now. Did you know that? God's kingdom is here right now, right here. And God's kingdom is activated within us as we yield our hearts, our minds, and our lives to the Holy Spirit. He activates the kingdom within. We become empowered to live out kingdom values. And so we've been looking at the book of Acts. This is week three. We've, uh, we're, we've been looking at the, books of Act, uh, the book of Acts to discover um, and understand the values of God's kingdom, uh, if you will, the characteristics of God's kingdom uh, on earth as it is in heaven, okay? Today, we're going to look at how the kingdom of God is bold. The kingdom of God is bold. Now, so far, we've already looked at relational, right? The kingdom of God is relational. We were created to grow spiritually in the context of relationships. That's the church, right? Last week, Larry helped us to see that the kingdom of God is miraculous, We saw that the ultimate purpose of miracles, you know, of healing disease, of raising the dead, it's always to glorify the Father. And yet, as we heard, there are mysteries that we don't understand, right? Sometimes God chooses not to heal. And so we pray boldly because we're commanded to. We pray boldly in faith, knowing that he can bring about the miraculous. But our faith also means that we trust him no matter what the outcome is, right? We choose to trust him anyway, no matter what the ultimate answer is. God glorifies himself in different ways. And often, the way he glorifies himself are in ways that we didn't anticipate, and that's okay. It's not about what we pray anyway. It's about how we pray. Jesus said this then is how, not what you should pray, but how you should pray. See, if we pray with doubt, oh God, I pray you'd heal this, uh, do this situation, whatever it is, but we're filled with doubt and we're timid about it and we're filled with fear, that's different than if we pray with a heart that is fully yielded to God's will. Whatever you want, God, I'm okay with. And yet I'm going to pray in faith that this takes place. Do you see the difference? If I'm going to pray and say, but it's okay, God, if you decide not to answer in the way I want because I'm really not believing that you can or you, that you will. That's different than, I want this, Lord God, and I, I pray this, and yet I'm okay with whatever decision you make, because you're God. Difference. Do you see the difference? Are we good? Okay, so today, in fact, going along that line, we're actually going to look at someone who was killed for his faith in Jesus. How, how do you think that prayer went? God helped this person not to die for you, okay? Uh, Stephen is his name. He was the very first Christian martyr, Stephen. Okay, why would God allow that? God, who's a miracle-working God, why would he allow that? In John 11, we read that that Jesus' friend Lazarus got sick. But instead of dropping everything and rushing to Lazarus' side to do one of his really cool tricks and miracles, right? He decided to stay where he was for two more days and allow Lazarus to die, only to raise him back to life again. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, let's cut out the middleman, the middle step, right? And let's just get right to the point, heal him before he even has to die. But I'm not God, and the rest of you collectively said, thank you, Jesus, for that, right? Um, God knew what he was doing. In fact, Jesus even said that I am going to be glorified as I glorify my Father through the situation with Lazarus. So this is how God is, okay? But can you imagine what Stephen's relatives may have been wondering just a few years after this healing and raising from the dead of Lazarus? Stephen, the first martyr who was killed for being a Christian. Can you imagine what his parents must have been thinking? You know, hey, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So why won't he raise my Stephen? But folks, here, God does what God does. Here is where God uses this tragedy of persecution to do something else miraculous. God uses the miraculous uh, situation that they found themselves in to, to uh, sorry, God did something miraculous with this situation. And what I mean by that is that God used this terrible tragedy of persecution, of, of the first martyr being killed for his faith to cause the explosive growth of the church. God knew what he was doing. 
And that's why we trust him. So let's get some backstory. Can we do that? A little backstory of what this Stephen thing is all about. So grab your Bibles if you would. We're going to be looking at um, Acts chapter 5 through 8. We're not going to do the whole thing, uh, sections of it, but we're going to turn there, okay? So Acts, the book, uh, it, it's called the book of Acts, if you will. So you've got the Old Testament and the New Testament about three quarters of the way into the book known as the Holy Bible. Uh, we have them right in front of you, underneath the seats in front of you. If you didn't bring your own, I encourage you always to bring your own or to use a uh, Bible app. You can do that too. Um, but if you didn't, grab one of those Bibles and turn there. So the, the Old Testament's about three quarters of the book. The back quarter, the back, the end quarter is the New Testament. Old Testament, New Testament, okay? New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those are the four, first four books, if you will, of the Gospels. It's all about Jesus. And then Acts is the very next book, and that's about what happened after Jesus ascended, if you will, into heaven. And um, the apostles, the disciples... Um, began to go to town, and the, the, the church begins to explode and to spread. So uh, this page 1082 is the beginning of chapter 5. So we'll be jumping around, so keep the Bible open, okay? We're going to be jumping all around, but uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 5, um, if you will, and we'll start right around there. So what, what's the backstory of this whole Stephen thing? Stephen, the first martyr, he gets killed for his faith, okay? What's the backstory? Well, it, it talks about how the apostles... Um, again, Jesus now ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost already. So you get all of these Christ followers who were radically saved, if you will. They're completely on fire for Jesus. And crazy things are happening. The Holy Spirit has entered all of these, these Christ followers, and, and now they're empowered to do these crazy things. Can I have some help moving this out of the way? Because I feel constrained, and I'm just going to steamroll my way right through all of this stuff. <laughs> Thank you, brother. So, um, so the apostles are doing these crazy things. They're performing all kinds of miracles, things that only Jesus did. And by the way, if you have read any of the gospel, you'll also hear and read, and you'll see that Jesus said that you, talking to his followers, you will do even greater things than I've done. So anyway, this is going on. The apostles are performing all these signs and wonders among the people that are there. People are just like their jaws are hitting the ground. They can't believe what's going on. There are tons of men and women who are coming into the fold of the church, who are becoming believers. It's happening constantly, consistently, and the church is growing rapidly. People, it says, people would bring their sick and lay them on mats in the street so Peter's shadow would touch them and they would be healed. Crazy things going on. What is the deal with the Holy Spirit? These people are radicals. Can you imagine, though, the miracles? I mean, what, what you know, the head, headlines of the, the newspaper would look like back in the day? It's incredible what was happening. Crowds were gathering from towns outside of Jerusalem. They were bringing their sick so they could be healed, and they were getting healed. It was incredible what was going on. So that's the backstory. all right? So I want you to turn to verse 17, chapter 5, Acts chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 17, okay? And we're going to just pick up where, this, this, uh, where I left off. Again, all this great stuff is happening. All right? Everybody is coming to, uh, to the disciples to see what, you know, just to be part of what's going on. There's this excitement, this enthusiasm. And of course, the religious leaders of the day were very, very pleased because everybody was getting closer to God through this as we look uh, at verse 17. It says, Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of Sadducees were filled with... Pride, happiness, excitement, jealousy. Oh, we can't relate to any of that. That makes no sense. Jealousy, what? Verse 18, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. That's a cool miracle. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. Verse 21, at daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. Skip down to verse 42. We just don't have time to read all of it. I want to pull out some key uh, contextual passages here, though. Verse 42 of chapter 5. It says, day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching. They never stopped proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Now I want you to skip to chapter 6, okay, verse 8. So you see what's going on, right? 
the authorities, the religious authorities, if you will, are getting jealous. They're upset. They tell him, shut up. Stop talking about Jesus. Okay? But they wouldn't listen. They kept proclaiming the truth. Verse 8 of chapter 6. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. By the way, I, this was pointed out to me in our teaching team meeting this week, or maybe last week, that Stephen... It says, a man full of God's grace and power. This is the, the first guy, if you will, um, that is mentioned who was not one of the original disciples. Okay, Stephen, it says, a man full of God's grace and power did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Okay, we're going to skip uh, two more times. Okay, chapter 7, verses 55 through 60. So basically between what I just read and now, what we're going to read, um, Stephen basically preaches a sermon that gets the religious leaders uh, in a tizzy. They get really mad, okay, talking about how Christ, Jesus, is, is the Son of God, is the Messiah, the Savior. Seven, chapter 7, verses 55 through 60, it says, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they, which is referring to the religious authorities, covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Now, if you're wondering what that means, it is not what you may think it means. What it means is they took stones and threw them at him, literally, okay? There were two ways that they did it, and they were both kind of gross. Uh, this is one. The other one is they put weights on top of them, and then they put stones until they couldn't restrain, you know, withhold the weight, and bad things happened. But they were throwing rocks at him at this, at this point, okay? And look at what it says, verse 58. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. We'll be hearing more about Saul the chief persecutor of the church, next week. Verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Does that sound reminiscent of anyone you know? Jesus said something very similar. Verse 60, then Stephen fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Does that sound like anyone familiar? Jesus said something very similar. When he had said this, he fell asleep, it says. And then one last time, skip to verse 1 of chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1. It says, and Saul, there he is again, Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Okay, three questions today. Three questions. Here's the first one. Why were they so bold? Why on earth were these apostles, these, these Christ followers, the, the early church people, why were they so, so bold? You see, when you receive Christ, initially you get some boldness, okay? Because you realize, oh my goodness, I once was lost, but now I'm, I'm found. Okay, the old is gone, the new has come. Oh my goodness, in Christ all, are, we become a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Renewed our series, right, several months ago. Okay, so, so this, this initial boldness does come, okay? And so they received this boldness and they were drawn together. The believers were drawn together through this common relationship that they had with Jesus, one with another. They were united by a mutual love for Jesus and a crazy, insatiable desire to share Jesus with everyone. They gave and they received encouragement and strength from one another constantly, consistently. It says in, early, in the early part of Acts that they gathered together constantly. They were together so you can understand how they would be encouraged consistently, right? There was very little room for life to settle in and to, to kind of, you know, drag them away and make them, you know, well, you know, I'm going to start second-guessing my decision to follow Jesus. They were constantly with one another. They were so excited that they just couldn't keep it to themselves. Flip back to chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. They couldn't keep this excitement of their salvation to themselves. Chapter 4, verse 18 through 20. So we're going back before this whole thing happened with Stephen, okay? Right before it. 
Okay, it says then, or the the religious leaders is who they're talking about. So then the religious leaders called Peter and John in again and commanded them, listen to this, commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Yeah, okay. Verse 19, but Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. A little bit of boldness there, would you say? We cannot stop. We will not stop speaking about the truth. Folks, this is why we as a church do events like Kids Fest. This is why we do events like Extravaganza, why we do movie nights, why we reach out to people in need. This is why we do it. Why? Because we can't keep the news of Jesus to ourselves. We can't just, you know, keep the news of of our salvation and the hope that Jesus provides for us to ourselves. We can't do that. We have to share it with people. That's why we do things like this. Folks, their boldness was not just an unavoidable byproduct either. It wasn't like, okay, well, you know, God's come through the Holy Spirit doing really cool things, and so they're going to just get bold, I guess, just because it comes along with the whole thing, right? No, they prayed specifically for boldness. Turn just a few chapter, a few verses ahead, actually, um, in verse 29. Chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. Okay, it says this, this is their prayer, the disciples' prayer, okay, during the, pers- the start of the persecution. It says, now Lord, they're praying, now Lord, consider their threats of the authorities, right? And enable your servants to speak your word sheepishly, <laughs> tentatively, quietly. No, it says, enable your servants in the midst of the persecution that's being threatened. Enable us to speak your word with great boldness. Hold nothing back. Verse 30, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Verse 31, after they prayed, is that courage? Does that require courage to pray for boldness in the midst of insanity going on all around? Sure it does. Verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. (laughs) And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Why do we pray? Why do we gather together as a church body to pray? Because it's a good Christian duty? Because we want to check off the box and get that off of our you know, conscience for the day? No, it's because we realize and we recognize that the only way God's going to change us, much less the world around us, is when we are in prayer, when we are seeking his face, when the Holy Spirit changes us and empowers us. And the only way that's possible is if we yield our hearts to the Holy Spirit. And the way we do that is to pray, because prayer aligns our minds and our hearts with God's. That's what they were doing. That's why they had boldness. Yes, they prayed for it, but it wasn't a magic incantation. It was a reflection of a heart that was was broken, that was yielded to the influence of the Holy Spirit. God, please give us the boldness that we know is necessary in order to do what you have called us to do, the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations. That's not a very easy thing to do, and it is not possible humanly. It's only possible through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Folks, this boldness was not put on. It was for real. Okay, second question. Why were they so persecuted? We know why they were bold. It's the Holy Spirit. They wanted it. Why were they so persecuted? Why does the kingdom of God bring about such persecution? Why? You see, their boldness drew attention, didn't it? Their boldness drew attention and jealousy of those who were in power. Maybe they were afraid, oh, they're going to get more popular than us. 
Maybe it was a popularity contest. Maybe they felt threatened. Maybe it was a political threat that they sensed. What are they going to do? They're going to win over all of these people, and then they're going to overthrow us. Legitimate concerns, perhaps. It's possible. But either way, whatever it was, it led, their boldness led to their persecution. But here's the irony about persecution, because often persecution will lead to an enhanced level of boldness. So at first we have initial boldness, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's persecution that comes. We get, you know, penalized or punished in some way, you know, threatened in some way um, because of our faith. And then often that leads to an enhanced level of, of boldness, even greater boldness. See, this boldness, folks, this, this fearlessness that they were consumed by, this, this courage of, of the believers challenged the system. It challenged the status quo. And those in power, whether it's political power, because they were involved in the persecution too, uh, religious power, whatever, they reacted out of fear. They were re- Are you hearing me? They felt threatened, so they reacted out of fear and tried to stomp out the church. That's exactly what happened. You know what? Does that sound familiar to anybody? It's awesome. Perfect. Do it again. I'm talking to your mom and dad. Those in power did not understand, and so they reacted out of fear. Racism, anyone? How about this? Homophobia? Now, I'm going to define this. I'm going to define this. It's important, okay? I want you to know, I'm going on record, to say that disagreeing with a lifestyle does not make you homophobic. I'm talking about the truest definition of homophobia, okay? I'm afraid of someone who is different than me, and so I'm going to try to stomp them out or exclude them or cut them out. That is ungodly. Okay, I want to be clear about that, all right? So don't, don't be led to believe what the culture says, that if you disagree with someone, then that means that you hate them or you're afraid of them. That's not true. But I'm talking about the purest definition of what we're talking about when we talk about homophobia, when we talk about racism, you know, sexism. I don't care. Fill in the blank, okay? But that's exactly, this is religious persecution, Okay? There's all kinds of persecution. It's all ungodly, okay? But in this sense, okay, those in power reacted out of fear, as we tend to do as human beings anyway, and they tried to stomp out the church. But here's something that happened that they didn't expect. Something crazy happened that makes no sense whatsoever. The persecution of the church caused it to spread everywhere. The persecution, the, the martyrdom that was happening, okay, caused the church to spread everywhere. God used, in his wisdom, the tragedy of persecution to miraculously supercharge the growth of the church. How? Well, it makes me think of our awesome neighbor to this building, uh, Lou. Uh, Lou is, uh, actually bought the house that used to be the church parsonage, and he lives right next door. And um, there's a strip of grass, if you've noticed, where the parsonage is, the, the church-owned house, you know, the house that doesn't belong on the rest of the street. It's too small and weird. But anyway, okay, so there's a driveway that goes down to the garage, and there's a little strip of grass, okay, that separates, if you will. Uh, it doesn't separate. It's our, it's our property. But Lou has been fertilizing it and weeding it for several years. And it, we finally, I think this week, right, we finally got to, to, to you know, ask him, do you want us to cut our property or do you want to do that part? Either way. Because we were trying to be polite. It wasn't sarcastic or whatever. He said, I, actually, I'd, I'd rather do it. And the reason why is because uh, the front lawn of the parsonage is a dandelion uh, like field is what it is. We just don't spend, we don't have the money to make it look really nice like the rest of the property on the street 
that used to be ours, by the way. It was all ours at one point. But anyway, so that's a buffer zone that he fertilizes so that the dandelions, you know, don't go into his yard. Genius! The guy is awesome, by the way. He's great. He's the super, just a super guy. But I thought that was kind of, kind of genius, you know, pretty smart. But, you know, what they were doing in persecuting the church without knowing it in advance, it's like they went into a dandelion field, that, the dandelions that were all, you know, t- uh, they were all seeding, right? So they were all, you know, you, you know and they're stomping on dandelions. What's going to happen? You're not going to kill the dandelions. You're going to spread them everywhere. Or how about those mushrooms? Those mushrooms that look like smoke? Did you ever see those? That's not smoke. Those are spores. Don't breathe them in because you'll have mushrooms growing out of your mouth at some point. Right? But it's the same idea. That's what they were doing. Do you understand how this works? That's what they were doing. They were trying to stomp out the church, but God had a different idea, didn't he? God had a totally different plan. God knew what he was doing. Why did he allow Stephen to die? Because that was the catalyst that created a tidal wave of the Holy Spirit spreading the gospel, spreading the church all around the world. God in his wisdom knew what he was doing. Did he intend, did he want Stephen to die? Of course not. Did he want his son to die? No, but there was, that was the option. That was it, right? That was the plan. And he's God, and we embrace him, and we embrace his reasons. He, he knows what he's doing, and we don't. On top of all this persecution stuff, on top of this, Jesus himself reassures us in the face of this persecution. In Matthew 5, 11 through 12, I'm going to read it real quick for the sake of time. Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. All right, so this is all great. That's great. 2,000 years ago, thanks for telling me the history lesson. I love it. But what on earth does this have to do with me today? What about today? You know, today in very many, in a a number of, of countries all around the world, Today, at this very day, there are churches that operate underground. The underground church. I don't know if you've heard of that term or not, but basically all it means is that they are unable to worship openly. All around the world. And uh, Pastor Elisha uh, recently heard from one of the leaders of the underground church in China. And this leader of the underground church um, had a very strange prayer request that he disseminated out. And here was his prayer request. Pray that the persecution does not stop. Okay, I I thought that we were supposed to pray uh, for the persecution to stop so that they could be free to worship. They requested that the persecution does not stop. Why? Because that church leader knows that without persecution, our boldness gets smothered. Without persecution, with too much affluence, with too much comfort and too much acceptance, our fervor cools down. And that leads me to the third and final question this morning. How bold are we? How bold are we? Folks, what often happens today in our culture, when someone receives Christ, it's a different story. Oh, we're all so excited, you know, we're very enthusiastic, we're zealous, and we want to share him with everyone, but instead of being drawn together with others in the church through this common relationship with Jesus, we try to keep things the way they've been, individualistic. We try to keep the fire burning on our own, That's so different than the early church. Do you see the difference? It's so different. We don't give and receive encouragement and strength from one another as much as they did. Our initial excitement is met with, "Uh, good for you, but just don't get all religious on me, okay? And without the support and encouragement from the church, discouragement sets in very quickly. We learn to keep our beliefs to ourselves 
And presto, the enemy has successfully neutralized you as a threat. He has stomped out part of the church, and we've let him. Why is the threat of of just being teased? Listen to me. Why is the threat of just being teased for most Christ followers today more effective at silencing us than the threat of being killed was for Christ followers 2,000 years ago? Why? I'm not immune to this, folks. You know, I moved from the parsonage in 2012, January 3rd, a day that will live forever in infamy. No. Um, And um, one of the things, and I've said this before, I, I I don't want people to know who are not part of the church. I don't want people to know that I'm a pastor right away. You know, it's not that I'm ashamed. It's just people have assumptions, right? So, oh, you're a pastor. Okay. And then they immediately say, you know, back away. And, you know, it's like, so the joke is that our neighbor uh, at one time, right here, he's not our neighbor now because we moved. I just said that. But anyway, um, we, we, uh, Aaron, our, our youngest son, and his oldest were the same age, and they were um, at a basketball game. Both of them on the same team or playing opposite each other, whatever. And so we were developing a relationship. Long story short, um, there was, uh, I think it was a soccer game this particular day. Um, but uh, Steve Bedard, our neighbor, um, uh, saw me and said, oh, hey, come on over. And he said, hey, and he had some friends with him. And, uh, and he said, uh, oh, hey, this is Dan the pastor. So I just came back with a great one. Benjamin, you'd be proud. My comeback was, okay, this is Steve the landscaper, and they laughed. They thought it was funny. But the point is that I don't want people to build up walls right away because I want to you know, try to develop a relationship or whatever it takes. And so I moved, um, and i got to make this really short and sweet, but I, I wonder, you know, my new neighbors... You know, I don't, I, when, do I, when do I tell them? When, when does that come up? When do I make that opportunity here? And, and our next door neighbor directly across the street is here. Peter, love you, man. So glad you're here, brother. Uh-oh. Um, I don't know if I want to do that. Yes, please. Peter's dealing with brain cancer. He's working through brain cancer. You were in the, I'm sorry, Peter, so you were in the, you were in the emergency room? Mm-hmm. Mm. That's all right. Je- so, <laughs> so Jesus was there. You're saying that he was there to help you and to comfort you, and he took away the pain? Praise God. Woo! Oh, that's awesome. Oh. Always time for stories of God's amazing work. That's awesome. Oh, thanks for sharing, Peter. So anyway, just to summarize my story. Uh, so basically, I'm there, and I'm just like, oh, I don't know when to, you know, how do I open up to our neighbors? How do they... Come to find out, okay, three years later, that everybody on the street knew I was a pastor. <laughs> they already knew. They were anticipating. And, and here's what I'm getting at, because I knew about Peter's situation, and I was, I was praying, but, you know, was there fear in the way? Did I not say something sooner? God took, it took God using my son Kyle to invite him to our church that he doesn't go to, and he showed up because of Kyle. And, and I'm like, that was God's way of kicking me in the butt. Well, if you're not going to do it, I'll get your son to invite him. <laughs> I'm like, what? And it was humbling. Because I realize, you know, I, I don't know if that excuse is really an excuse anymore. I think there is, maybe I got kind of, I lost my boldness at some point. Maybe that's what, what's happened. And um, my very next door neighbor, so Peter's directly across the street, and then my next door neighbor on the right, um, Marie and, and Jack. Jack, um, the they're, they're elderly, and Jack passed away. And I got a chance to minister to, uh, to Marie, and I went next door, and I just felt boldness at that time, and um, went to the funeral, the whole thing, and it was sad. Um, but they were such great neighbors, and they, they brought us like a little loaf of bread when we first moved there, the whole thing. It was really sweet. Anyway, so I, I wanted to, to, to love on them, so I, I knocked on her door, and, and uh, I just came in, and I just said, 
I just, I just said, I'm so sorry for your loss. Can I pray with you? And I prayed with her for the first time. This is only about maybe three months ago or something like that, if that, maybe not that, even that long ago. And then she said something. She said, thank you so very much. She said, I heard that you were a pastor. And I was wondering, and she trailed off and didn't finish her sentence. That hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, I heard you were a pastor, and I was wondering when you were going to pastor me. Or, you know what I mean? I, I, she never finished it, and I didn't ask her. But it was like, oh, I'm a pastor. I should know better than this, right? I'm human too. So I can get pulled into this. We all can. And that's why the question is, how bold are we? How bold are we? Folks, much of the church of Jesus today is suffering with a term I came up with this week. I'm going to call it missional suffocation. Missional suffocation. The mission of Jesus that was given to each believer, that's you and me if you're a professor of Christ, if you profess Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Okay, the mission that he gave to you is to go and make disciples, but it is being suffocated. It's a slow and subtle process that's taken place over time. Our faith has been undermined. Our identity has been redefined. Godly values have been eroded and are being replaced with incompatible, self-focused values. Folks, this kind of persecution that we're talking about isn't driving us to go underground. This kind of persecution is driving us to go undercover, to be secretive, to be hush-hush, to not tell anybody lest we upset them. Folks, what is this sinister threat to the church today that keeps us spiritually incapable, ineffective and impotent? What is it? Turn to Romans 12, and we're bringing this to a close, but this is so crucial. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says these words, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Folks, the threat to the church in 2016 is cultural conformity. Cultural conformity. Folks, when our identity is found not in Jesus, but in others' opinions, our boldness dissolves. When we are more afraid of sabotaging our social life than living for Jesus... The resulting spiritual paralysis holds the Holy Spirit back from working within and through us as his church. When it's more important to fit in, to be accepted, to be popular, than it is to share the incredible message of salvation through Jesus with our after-work drinking buddies, we have been spiritually castrated. God's kingdom has come to the whole world, folks. This kingdom is bold. But here's the ultimate question for us today. The ultimate question for each of us. Are we living for God's kingdom? Or are we living to build our own kingdom? Are we living for God's kingdom? Or are we living for our own kingdom? We need to be bold for Jesus, but how? It's clear. We've already discussed it. The Holy Spirit brings boldness, but the Holy Spirit will only bring boldness to us after we repent from cultural conformity. He will only come and empower us after we come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Not try to blend in, not try to be like everybody else so that we don't stand out. Do you think the early church thought that way? No. They prayed for boldness. Why? Because they knew that was how God was going to use them to change the world. Do you want God to use you to change the world today? Is that what you want? Then prove it by your life. Next week, we're going to talk about transformational. Again, God reached the early church's number one persecutor. He, he reached the early church's number one persecutor to reach the world. We're going to hear more about that. Tonight, we're going to pray together because prayer is powerful at six o'clock. I encourage you, make it a priority. Be here. God is moving in power among us, the few of us that gather. 10, 12, 15, whatever. Let's make it 50, shall we? Let's see what God wants to do when we get serious about this. 
As the worship band comes up to sing our last song, the Holy Spirit, I know, is speaking to some of you. I know it. There's no question. There's no doubt. Maybe he's speaking to you about boldness, about conformity. In a few brief moments, I'm going to invite you to respond to the Holy Spirit. This is how we're going to apply today's truth. This is how we're going to do it. We tangibly respond. But first, let's remember. Let's remember what made the disciples so bold. What was it? What was it that made the disciples so bold? It was the resurrection. It was the power of God on display. You know he's alive today. Do you want the boldness that he has for you? Are you sick and tired of being the wimp spiritually that God has not called you to be? Are you ready to stand forward, to step forward, to stand up and to say, I want the boldness, Lord, that only you have for me? You can start right here, right now. We're going to be here for as long as it takes, and we're going to pray for God to give boldness to whoever asks just like the first church, the early church, just like back in the day, they prayed for boldness in faith. If you would like to pray for boldness and to pray for an increase in faith, this is a great opportunity to do it. For the rest of you, I understand if you can't stay, and that's okay. You are dismissed in just a moment when I pray, but for the rest of us, if you'd like to stay, I want to challenge you. Stay and see what God has for you. See the life that he has in store for each of us when we yield fully to the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we love you so very much. God, we want to be captivated by you, just like the early church was, just like those first disciples, God. We want to be embraced by you. We want to stand away from the culture, God, that is doing whatever it can. The enemy of our soul, Satan himself, is trying to keep us quiet to keep us from making the impact and fulfilling the great commission that you've called us to, God. And we won't stand for it anymore. We don't accept that lie and those lies from him anymore. So God, we pray for those that will come or stay, God, and seek your face and your boldness. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for what you're about to do. Amen.